There's no nation, no people, no religion, and no philosophy which doesn't seek justice or at least purport to do so. In fact, any movement that seeks popular support will, sooner or later, draw its strength from the claim that its objective is justice, a claim that has a primal appeal. Every parent knows that even the very young have a strong sense of fairness, although there's usually a lag between the first claims of it's not fair and the capacity to res resist funding someone to get what you want. Um, it, it should also be gathered that otherwise fair-minded parents are curiously resistant to such pleas. As Bill Cosby says, parents are not interested in justice, they just want peace and quiet. <laughs> we can all relate to that, I think. Yet whilst the acceptance of justice is a virtue, uh, recognised as universal, recognising the imperfections of humanity and the harshness of perfect justice may temper enthusiasm for its application. Consider Port Portia's courtroom oration in The Virgin of Venice. First she entreats Shylock to show mercy to Antonio. It's an attribute to God himself, she says, of mercy. And earthly power doth be to show like as gods when mercy seasons justice. But she ends up threatening him with justice. Therefore, Jew, if justice be thy plea, consider this, that in the course of justice, none of us will reach salvation. We might fear the consequences of justice, but probably more importantly, we doubt the success of our search for it. Clearly then, the fact that we continue to seek justice is a product of deep-seated morality, something for the moral philosophers and theologians to explore, and a pragmatic acceptance that imperfect justice is better than none. But our sense of justice is enlivened, not just when dealing with disputes in court, but in just about every area of society. We want it to inform not only our judges, but also our policy makers, legislators, law enforcers, administrators, priests, employers, doctors, teachers, lawyers, journalists, and sporting referees. A central theme of this lecture is that in a society as large and complex as ours, our attempts to do justice in the resolution of disputes might focus much and perhaps more upon procedures as upon matters of substance. Focusing on procedural justice helps us navigate the problem of reasonable disagreement. In a complex multicultural society, disagreement is a fact of life, a fact of political life. Whatever problems we face, whether they are problems arising from the need to distribute scarce resources or to limit our liberties, it is inevitable that we will disagree about what amounts to a just outcome. Shylock's speech is redolent with his sense of justice. If you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? If you poison us, do, you not die? do we not die? And if you wrong us, do we not revenge? If we are like you in the rest, we will resemble you in that. So this disagreement is so, even when as citizens we agree on certain fundamental principles of justice. As any observer of the United States Supreme Court knows, even in a society that commits to a set of governing moral principles, like those found in the first ten amendments of the Constitution of the United States, people disagree on what they should mean. Agreement at a general level, for instance agreement that punishment should not be cruel and unusual, or that government should not abridge the freedom of speech, fractures in specific cases. Even if we agree that punishment should not be cruel and unusual, we disagree about whether this applies to the death penalty or to um, the incarceration, um, uh, certain conditions of incarceration like overcrowding. We disagree about the limits on a widely held principle like freedom of speech. What about flag burning? What about cross burning? What's more, this disagreement is in practical terms ineradicable. We have no way, or at least no practical way, to resolve our disagreements on these matters. And on them, our disagreements are deep and pervasive and enduring. When Jeremy Waldron, in Law and Disagreement, uh, says that politics is about disagreement, he's making a point about those irreconcilable and reasonable disagreements about justice. In his view, 
No one in the trade now believes that if two people disagree about rights, one of them at least must be either corrupt or morally blind. While most judges will at some point have encountered a claimant who strongly believes that there are only two possible outcomes, his success or the judge's corruption, as a society, I think we have reluctantly come to accept that a perfectly just outcome is not always achievable, or even if achievable, we cannot reliably recognise it. In the face of disagreement, procedure is all we have. If we get to our procedure, if if we get our procedures right, we have a chance of getting people of all persuasions to accept our decisions, even when the decisions are not in their favour. Thus, procedural justice is one way of mitigating the problem caused by deep moral and political disagreement. Once it is accepted that just outcomes cannot reliably be achieved, let alone agreed upon, the notion of what is fair quickly begins to change. Instead of focusing on substantive justice and the intrinsic fairness of the result, it becomes more useful to focus on the procedures which are invoked to decide the dispute. The concept of fair evolves and justice acquires a new meaning. The idea that an outcome can be defined as fair, not because of the result itself, but because it is the outcome of a fair procedure, was key in the earliest formation of our current legal system as in the Magna Carta's promise in 1215 of judgment only according to law. Procedural fairness famously finds recognition in the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments to the Constitution of the United States, which respectively forbid federal and state governments from depriving any person of life, liberty or property without due process of law. If, however, this vital search for justice is pragmatically reduced to a search for procedural fairness, it's particularly important to consider what makes a process fair. Even here, as we will see, ideals are curtailed by practicality. In the most general terms, there are two aspects to procedural justice, a fair hearing and an impartial decision maker. What is required for a fair hearing and, what, and how do we judge fairness? In the most formal of circumstances, uh, judges are the arbiters of procedural fairness. In discussing the art of, uh, of judging, Chief Justice Roberts of the US Supreme Court related a story told by John Dewey, which the Chief Justice said is an accurate metaphor for judging. This was a story about the way they used to weigh pigs in Texas. To avoid merely guessing the weight of the pig, they would take a long plank, balance it on a rock, tie the pig on one end, pile stones on the other end until the log was evenly balanced, and then guess the weight of the stones. <laughs> the Chief Justice appears to be suggesting that one ought to be sceptical of the formality and complexity of the rituals of the legal system, because in the end, the final judgment is still, at best, just a guess. Is it true that all our elaborate jurisprudence is a brittle veneer, painstakingly applied to mere intuition? I don't think so. An interesting repost of the pig weighing story, uh, which I found on the web on a um, site appropriately entitled The Stone Project, uh, recognises that most people find the story humorous, if not completely ridiculous, but it puts another cast on it. The missing bit of information is that most stone weighs around 165 pounds a cubic metre. The density weight of the pig can vary enormously. It's easier to look at stone and estimate how many cubic feet it contains than to try to figure out the weight of the, key, of the pig by relying on its size or by sight. According to this website, a surprisingly accurate approximation of pig weight can be obtained in this way. It's true that procedures may never be perfect, and it's true that may, they may not operate with mathematical precision or be guaranteed to produce a just outcome. Nevertheless, the established principles, rules and practices do more than just obfuscate. They provide a genuine framework for the work of a decision maker, which is strengthened by the addition of experience to produce something that is more reliable than mere intuition and much better than a guess. Procedural justice is not perfect justice, 
but more, nor is it mere sleight of hand. The great US administrative law jurist, Judge Henry Friendly, uh, gave a seminal exposition of what is required for a hearing, for a fair hearing, in his article, Some Kind of Hearing. The argument was prompted by a decision of the Supreme Court in Goldberg and Kelly, in which the court held that before being deprived of certain government welfare benefits, a recipient was entitled to a hearing before an impartial decision maker, which must include the rights of personal appearance, of confrontation and cross-examination, and to retain an attorney. The case was widely regarded as imposing an unsustainable burden on decision makers, given the number of such decisions. According to Judge Friendly, 240,000 cases of benefits terminated and about the same number of benefits reduced in the one year. <clears throat> I'm not sure about that figure, but that's what he said. The judge was deeply concerned about how far the hearing requirement was spread. He explained that procedural requirements entail the expenditure of limited resources and at some point the benefit to individuals from an additional safeguard is substantially outweighed by the cost of providing such protection. And the expense of protecting those likely to be found undeserving will probably come out of the pocket of the deserving. The judge set about formulating criteria against which the degree of procedural fairness required uh, could be measured. He began by matching elements of procedural justice with types of government action in order to show which were appropriate for each type of government action. <clears throat> the mistake in Goldberg and Kelly, as Judge Friendly saw it, was that the Supreme Court failed to distinguish between very different circumstances and applied uniform requirements of due process to all, resulting in a disproportionate procedure that ultimately produced widespread injustice. Uh, Judge Friendly's uh, analysis in what kind of hearing is still quoted with approval in the Supreme Court uh, in, at present times. A proportionate assessment of procedural fairness is not unfamiliar to Australian lawyers. Chief Justice French, delivering the Sir Anthony Mason lecture at Melbourne University Law School, asked whether procedural fairness was indispensable to justice. His Honour's answer was a decided yes, at least in respect of judicial decision making. When it comes to administrative decision making, the, the answer was more equivocal. His Honour acknowledged that as a practical matter, the content of procedural fairness would vary according to context, and that it does not require the judicialisation of administrative processes. The differing standards of procedural fairness required in courts versus administrative processes was also recognised in Keogh uh, and West where Justice Mason said that what is appropriate in terms of natural justice depends on the circumstances of the case, including the nature of the inquiry, the subject matter, and the rules under which the decision maker is acting. <coughs> what is clear is that they're not, and should not be, any definitive expre expression of the elements of procedural fairness. It will be inconsistent with the flexibility of the obligation that's recognised both here and in the United States. Flexible as it is, however, attempts to exclude procedural fairness are not uncommon. Those who are intent on the acquisition of power have always bridled against the restrictions of the rule of law. Even those who seek to exercise power for the best of reasons will find the rule of law a regular source of frustration and irritation. Attempts to place certain decisions beyond the law can therefore be found everywhere, not just in the reign of Charles I or revolutionary France, but in modern democracies. It's interesting to note that our modern legal and political philosophies recall with pride the introduction of rights and concepts which provided the bulwark against the arbitrary power of monarchies. Prime among these is the rule of law, in which, as we have seen, we've largely settled upon procedural fairness as the best surrogate for perfect justice. Yet modern democracies which espouse these values also regularly seek to exclude pr procedural fairness in our system of justice. Judicial attitudes to such attempts are not surprising. The courts will not readily presume that Parliament intends to exclude, exclude procedural fairness. 
they have constantly held that its exclusion requires a strong manifestation of contrary, contrary statutory intention. The legislators, for their part, have not been afraid of stating baldly where this is what they do intend. For example, a Victorian provision that in exercising its functions, the parole board is not bound by the rules of natural justice, or the federal parliament in relation to the approval of sites for radioactive waste, provided that no person is entitled to procedural fairness. But procedural fairness may also be limited by statute, which sets out an exa exhausting list of the elements of procedural fairness for the subject of that statute, uh, and uh, uh, a list which doesn't include some key elements. These apply to situations as diverse as immigration and refugee decisions and the regulation of casinos. <clears throat> Where procedural fairness is not excluded, the consequence of a breach can be serious. For example, in the High Court case of Ex parte Ayala, the Refugee Tribunal had told an applicant that it read all the papers from a previous application the applicant had made to the tribunal to the federal court. In fact, it didn't have all the relevant papers, but the applicant relied on this statement and didn't present further evidence. In their joint judgment, Justices Gordon and Gummo observed that the consequences of the breach were not gainsaid by classifying the breach as trivial or non-determinative of the ultimate result. The issue is whether there has or has not been a breach of the obligation. Another aspect is, um, of procedural fairness is, of course, the rule against bias. And the principle here is generally less problematic. One need hardly state the reason for a rule against bias. As Lord Denning said, the reason is plain enough. Justice must be rooted in confidence. And confidence is destroyed when right-minded people go away thinking the judge was biased. In the case of actual bias, one may act fairly add the injustice done to the person or persons directly affected. The fact that universities, schools, law firms, and all manner of institutions have codes of conduct, as well as parliament and statutory bodies, indicates the value of the principle. The obligation under these codes to declare conflicts of interest is aimed at preventing corruption, but also ensuring decision makers are unbiased in fact and appearance. We'd all be aware of the um, uh, last week when the Minister of Finance in New South Wales paid the price for not declaring an apparent conflict of interest. Um, and just to show that it's problems not confined to Australia or to New South Wales, the, last week also the Chairman of the United Kingdom Serious Organised Crime Agency resigned after also failing to declare a, a possible conflict of interest. It's clear then that procedural fairness is widely accepted as properly governing not just legal disputes, but a wide variety of human activity, especially in modern democracies such as ours. It has cemented itself in our history and philosophy as a public good, and its ready adoption beyond the legal sphere demonstrates that it has real force in the mind of the public. It's perhaps surprising in these circumstances that governments have been able to exclude it at all. I would suggest that this has, in part at least, been possible because they have limited themselves to laws affecting a relatively small number of people or places. For example, a law stating that no person is entitled to procedural fairness will receive less scrutiny when it applies to decisions affecting remote and scarcely populated land than metropolitan cities. However, the words, no person is entitled to procedural fairness, fall harshly on the ear, and the hold of these concepts on the public imagination is now sufficiently strong that it's hard to imagine similar language being adopted in statutes that affect mainstream populations of citizens. Is it for this reason that a new trend has observed, emerged? Rather than suspending certain well-accepted principles of justice within a legal jurisdiction, there has been an increasing movement towards placing certain people and locations outside the jurisdiction altogether. This raises a fundamental question, regardless of the quality or nature of justice. To whom do we extend justice? Who is outside the reach of our justice? And how is this decided? The concept of an outlaw has now degenerated into the description of a villain, or perhaps a hero, of an action movie, 
But in earlier times, the declaration that a person was an outlaw was the most extreme available measure. Outlaws were persons physically within the jurisdiction, but declared to be outside the protection of the law, unable to hold any property or sue in any court, and with no enforceable legal rights. Who are the modern day outlaws? I'll begin with a historical contrast that I find interesting. In 1960, the Israelis kidnapped, tried, and executed Adolf Eichmann for his crimes against Jews during the Second World War. The legalities of his kidnap and trial are debatable, although the morality of the case is quite clear. The point I would like to note, however, is that the Israelis immediately transported him from his hiding place in Argentina to Israel, thus bringing him within their undisputed jurisdiction and seeking to make him subject to their law. This is in stark contrast, contrast to the approach of the United States government since September 2011, where huge efforts have been made to keep suspected militants and terrorists that it captures outside its territory and hence outside the jurisdiction um, of its legal system. In November 2001, President G.W. Bush signed a military order entitled Detention, Treatment and Trial of Certain Non-Citizens in the War Against Terrorism. The order provided for suspected terrorists who were not United States citizens to be detained at a location designated by the Secretary of Defence. The detainees were to be tried by military commissions, the members of which did not need to be lawyers. Neither the ordinary rules of military law nor the ordinary law of the United States would apply. In making the order, President Bush said, I find that it is not practicable to apply in military commissions under this order the principles of law and the rules of evidence generally recognised in the trial of criminal cases in the United States District Courts. The person purpose of the order was to put the persons detained at Guantanamo Bay out of the reach of United States law. As we now know, the attempt was not entirely successful. In 2006, the Supreme Court decided in Hamdan and Rumsfeld that in the absence of congressional authorization, the president had no power to establish military commissions, which violated the Geneva Conventions and the Uniform Code of Military Justice. The court also held that detainees at Guantanamo Bay were entitled at least to the minimum level of protection contained in common Article 3 of the Geneva Conventions. Hamden and Rumsfeld in brief concerned a Yemeni national who was said to have acted as a bodyguard and chauffeur for Osama bin Laden and to have known, knowingly been involved in the transportation of weapons for Al-Qaeda. He was captured by militia forces in Afghanistan, in Afghanistan during hostilities in 2001 and then turned over to the US military which in 2002 transported him not to the United States but to Guantanamo Bay. Uh, what followed was uh, a series of uh, legal cases where the US Supreme Court held that Hamdan could not be tried by the military commission. Um, after several months uh, uh, the, after that decision, the US Congress passed legislation which reauthorised the military commissions. In 2008, the Supreme Court struck down part of that act um, and held that the right of habeas corpus review was constitutionally guaranteed and extended to persons held in Guantanamo Bay. Quite apart from the political debate triggered by these events, the product of these cases was a substantial body of jurisprudence which reaffirmed the primacy of procedural fairness in US law. The decisions of the court were unrelated to the substance of the charges, instead focusing on the power of the government to limit the justice constituency and whether those it was aiming to exclude were wholly or only partially deprived of the due process of law. Australia's attempt to redefine the justice constituency has been directed to a different problem, that of irregular or unauthorised maritime arrivals colloquially known as boat people. The approach was to sink the justice constituency by using the concept of the migration zone and distinguishing between those parts of Australia which are in the migration zone and those parts which have been excised from it. All citizens within the migration zone must hold a valid, sorry, all non-citizens within the migration zone must hold a valid Australian visa. 
A non-citizen in the Australian Migration Zone can, however, apply for one. But in 2001, the Howard government introduced uh, significant limitations to this right by excluding certain external territories, including Ashmore Island, Christmas Island and the Cocos Islands from the Migration Zone. Subject to exceptions not relevant here, a non-citizen who's entered a part of Australia outside the Migration Zone required the approval of the Minister for Immigration acting personally before being able to apply for a visa. So there's this bar to application that has to be met before an application can be made. Um, earlier this year, on the recommendation of the expert panel on asylum speakers, the Migration Act was amended to apply the same restrictions to arrival by sea anywhere in Australia. You'll see that referred to as excising the mainland from the migration zone. Uh, it's a quick way of putting it, but it didn't actually work that way, but the effect was the same. The consequences of these changes and the attempt to limit the rights of the boat people have been examined by the High Court in a number of cases. Uh, when those changes were first announced, Dr Michelle Foster, the Director of the International Refugee Law Research Program, criticised the decision as unprecedented. She said, the only example I know of in recent times is when several decades ago, France deemed part of one of its airports to be not France for the purposes of asylum. Asylum seekers took France to the European Court of Human Rights, which found that it was an entirely artificial exercise and had no bearing on France's international obligations. Of course, we don't have such a regional court, and so um, that's not likely uh, to be the way these issues are dealt with in Australia. In 2010, the High Court considered applications made by two Sri Lankans who, rely, who arrived on Christmas Island by boat. Their refugee claims were rejected and they were kept in detention until they were removed from Australia and were granted a visa. Although they claimed to be refugees, they could not, without the approval of the Minister, make a valid application under the Migration Act for a protection visa. The barrier to application was strong. Not only was approval to apply within the absolute discretion of the Minister, but the Minister was not obliged even to consider whether he should exercise his power of approval. Despite this, the Minister had declared that in every case uh, where refugee status was claimed, he in fact would look at it. The process was that before um, an application for approval was made to the Minister, an applicant's refugee claims would be assessed uh, by a, an officer of the Department of Immigration and then, if rejected, by an independent reviewer. Um, if the applicant was found by those to be a refugee, then um, the department would prepare a submission to the minister. The manuals that were prepared for the reviewer and the departmental officer in exercising these powers advised that the Migration Act, the migration regulations and the Australian case law were not binding, on the issue of refugees, were not binding uh, but could be used for guidance. In unanimous judgment, the High Court held that the advice in the manuals was legally incorrect and that in conducting the review, the reviewer was bound to afford procedural fairness to the person whose claim was being reviewed and was bound to act according to law by applying the relevant provisions of the Migration Act and the decided cases. Um, I don't have time this evening to go into uh, the reasoning in that case, but. Um, it will be in the uh, paper. <clears throat> Attempts to remove boat people from Australia's justice constituency took a further dramatic turn with the Gillard government's adoption of the Malaysia solution. As you know, that plan provided for the transfer to Malaysia of up to 800 boat people without prior assessment of their claims to be refugees. The power to transfer the refugee claimants arose under provision introduced into the Migration Act in 2001 to facilitate offshore processing, and it provided that the Minister might declare um, that for persons seeking asylum, a specified country, uh, which in the case under consideration turned out to be Malaysia, would had um, 
act would provide access to effective protection uh, for assessing their claims, meeting human rights standards, etc. Um, but as I think we're all aware, there was no binding legal obligation of either international or domestic law on Malaysia to meet those criteria. And for that reason, the court held that the minister's declaration uh, that Malaysia met the statutory criteria in the section was ultra-virus. Critical to the court's decision was that Malaysia was not a signatory to the Refugee Convention and was not under any other domestic or international legal obligation to comply with the section. Recent attempts by various governments, including the USA and Australia, to place certain persons and places outside the justice constituency represent one possible response to what is seen as the frustrating effect of procedural fairness principles on executive power. The reaction of courts, both in Australia and elsewhere, has been to assert with some degree of success the primacy of procedural fairness or due process. There is, however, yet another challenge which is posed by the shift of the threat to nations and their citizens from nation states to loosely organised cells of militants and terrorists. In this struggle, intelligence is the key weapon and this poses a particular problem for, for procedural fairness, namely the problem of secrecy. The grim works of Franz Kafka introduced a new word into the English language, Kafkaesque. A recurring theme in his works is the nightmare of secret accusation and the power of the stories is drawn in large part from the horror of a system in which people are judged and condemned of offences they do not understand against laws they are not permitted to know by means of an invisible and unaccountable bureaucracy. When the protagonist of the trial finds himself on trial for an offence of which he is not informed, he declares himself innocent and is immediately asked, innocent of what? Kafka's works were a powerful cry against the injustice of secrecy. Two factors generally regarded as fundamental to a fair hearing are that a person who may be subject to an adverse determination must be given notice of the proposed action and the grounds for asserting it and given an opportunity to respond and that judicial proceedings should be held in open court. There are, however, circumstances in which, in which both of these principles have been held to be wholly or partially inapplicable. The issues regarding secrecy and the question of a hearing in a closed court in which um, the court can look at evidence or hear arguments on behalf of one party without the other party knowing or being able to test the contents of the evidence and the arguments or even being able to see all the reasons why the court reached its conclusion, were conceded in the United Kingdom Supreme Court case, a Bank Malat case, uh, earlier this year. It concerned an order made under the Counter-Terrorism Act of 2008 by the UK Treasury, and it directed all persons operating in the financial sector that they were not to enter into or continue to participate in any business or transaction with Bank Malat and its subsidiary. The ban was intended to stop Bank Malat from operating in the UK because it was alleged to have helped finance Iran's nuclear weapons. An application for a closed hearing uh, was made because the case involved secret national security information and it was the first such application made uh, before the UK Supreme Court. Although the court expressed deep concern about the implications of closed hearing for procedural fairness, it held nevertheless that it had power to entertain a closed material procedure. Lord Newberger, um, who wrote the leading judgment with which the majority of the law, Lords concurred, observed that it would not be unreasonable, withdraw that, Lord Newberger observed that it would be unreasonable not to accept that. You can do a lot of damage with it, not. <laughs> the Act's aims of fighting the spread of terrorist activity and nuclear proliferation and improving the security of UK citizens are important aspects of the fundamental duties of the executive, and those aims would be at real risk of being severely hampered if the courts hearing financial restrictions proceedings could not 
adopt a closed material procedure. In its analysis, the court recognised the variable contact of procedural fairness and how the content of, content of procedural fairness needs to be titrated against the uh, significance of the subject matter in hand. And that tends to be the way the courts approach the question of secrecy. My present role as independent reviewer of adverse security assessments issued by the Australian Security Intelligence Organisation does involve applications from irregular or unauthorised maritime arrivals of people, uh, unlike uh, the Bank Malat case, which dealt with people within the jurisdiction. These people have arrived in Australia outside the migration zone and are therefore not within the Australian justice constituency, certainly not for all purposes. These people have been assessed to be refugees. They don't uh, undergo a security assessment unless they've been found to be refugees. And under Australians' international obligations, they are entitled to its protection. However, as explained earlier, they may not apply for a visa without the consent of the minister. Among the advice the minister seeks before making a decision whether to exercise his discretion is a security assessment from ASIO. Security assessments commonly involve secret information which is highly classified and may not be disclosed to anyone, including the subject of the assessment, who does not have appropriate security clearance. ASIO's power to make security assessments derives from the ASIO Act of 1979. In making an assessment, ASIO is making a prediction. It is assessing the risk that a subject may pose to security as defined in the ASIO Act. The definition of security is broad. It means the protection of Australia from various dangers, including not only espionage and sabotage, but also politically motivated violence and communal violence. It also encompasses protection of Australia's territorial and border integrity and carrying out Australia's responsibilities to other countries in relation to any of these matters. Security assessments made at the request of a government are made in the context of an administrative action or proposed administrative action, relevantly the grant of a protection visa. The question is whether the person would be a risk to security if he or she um, <clears throat> uh, were to be given a protection visa. It is not for ASIO to consider the consequences of the government not giving a visa even if this is as a result of an adverse security assessment. So ASIO is attempting to make a prediction about the future in the context of the definition of security in the ASIO Act. Unlawful non-citizens do not have a right to appeal against adverse security assessments. They can, however, seek review in the original jurisdiction of the High Court. And this uh, approach was taken in 2012 by an unlawful non-citizen who'd been found to be a refugee, application for protection visa refused because of his adverse security assessment. He goes under the catchy title of Plaintiff M47 of 2012. I'm going to be familiar and just call him Plaintiff 47. Um, among other things, the plaintiff claimed that he'd been denied procedural fairness by ASIO in the conduct of his security assessment. There were other very interesting issues in the case that I don't have time to go into here. He alleged that ASIO had failed to put him factual matters that ended up forming the basis of its adverse assessment. In finding that the plaintiff had not been denied procedural fairness, the factors taken into account by the five members of the High Court who considered the issue included a range um, of issues such as uh, an interpreter and the plaintiff's legal representative were both present and an interview of considerable duration. He was given an opportunity to have breaks to confer with his legal advisor and issues of concern to the interviewing office were made very clear to him um, and in particular where they didn't believe his story. Consistent with the variable content of procedural fairness, there was no suggestion by any of the justices that any of these factors was either necessary or sufficient for procedural fairness. There was also no rejection of the underlying proposition that in Australia, 
reasons of national security uh, make it impossible to disclose the grounds on which the executive proposes to act. And there are uh, authorities for that proposition that directly considered it, such as Salimi and McKellar in 1977 and Lagai and the Director General of Security in 2007. While little was said in Plaintiff M47 on the tension between secret information and procedural fairness, it was clearly accepted that, as was said in the report of the Hope Royal Commission, the understandable desire of individuals to have all of the rules of natural justice applied to security appeals must be denied to some extent. In reviewing ASIO's adverse security assessments, the principles of procedural fairness uh, are relevant for me at two levels. The terms of reference governing my appointment require me to examine all the material relied upon by ASIO in making the security assessment, decide whether the assessment is an appropriate outcome and make recommendations accordingly. It is for the Director General to decide whether to accept my recommendation. To date, no recommendation has been rejected. A fundamental issue to consider in forming my opinion is whether in making its assessment, ASIO accorded procedural fairness to the refugee. Similarly, I must ensure that in the course of my review, the applicant is also accorded procedural fairness. At both stages, the problem of secret material must be taken into account. In considering whether procedural fairness has been accorded at the assessment stage, and indeed in my own review, I'm guided by the observations of the High Court in Plaintiff M47. At all stages of the review, I'm required to obtain and adhere to ASIO's security advice on the protection of ASIO's intelligence capability. And that phrase is important. It's not just information. It's information and capability. What follows from this is that both at the initial and the review stages, the applicant has not been apprised of all the information that has led to his adverse assessment. Of course, this doesn't mean that the plaintiff has no, or the applicant has no relevant information. Much of the information, in fact, comes from the applicant personally, although it may be that its significance is not appreciated. The terms of reference attempt to ameliorate this difficulty by requiring ASIO to provide the applicant with an unclassified summary of its reasons for the assessment. Because of the security issues, these summaries tend to be very brief. However, they generally set out factual conclusions on which the assessment is based. For the purpose of the review, all applicants are legally represented. They are invited to make written submissions and all are given the opportunity to make oral submissions. Only one applicant so far has declined this opportunity. Oral submissions are heard in the relevant detention centre. They are conducted quite informally, and both the applicant and the lawyer are given an opportunity to speak. It's usual for me to have quite a long discussion with the applicant and his or her lawyer, and all three of us have the opportunity to ask questions. In setting up the process and trying to make it as fair as possible while maintaining the necessary secrecy, I've been conscious that the review is not an adversarial procedure. Neither ASIO nor the government is involved in any way. There is no opportunity for them even to make submissions, much less to influence the process in any way. That being so, I do not have to be concerned about giving another party an equal opportunity to be heard, and I can afford to be even generous in allowing the applicant to press his or her case. At the conclusion of the process, I prepare a detailed report, which is provided to the Attorney General, the Director General of Security, who's the head of ASIO, um, the Minister for Immigration, and the Inspector General of Security. That report contains all the uh, reference to all the material I've looked at and detailed explanation even of the highly classified material. That report, with necessary redaction to obscure classified material, is also provided to the applicant. In conclusion, my point has been that while substantive justice is and must remain the goal of any justice system worthy of the name, for practical purposes we rely on the procedural fairness to guide us to that goal. The emphasis on practical procedural fairness, rather than on a just outcome, recognises the truth of the old saying, perfection is the enemy of the good. Procedural fairness allows us to accept the decision of the umpire even though we disagree with it, not only in courts and tribunals, 
but also in the boardroom, the classroom, the market, the home, and even beyond, even in test cricket. Could any of us have missed the furious outcry when batsman Usman Khawaja, caught out behind verdict, was challenged during the third Ashes test? TV replays showed he was clearly not out. They showed daylight between bat and ball. Yet the decision review system failed miserably and the officials persisted in their original position. Notwithstanding all of that, Kawaja calmly walked away accepting the umpire's decision. Thank you.